Okay, so we are recording for the future. We are not live tonight. Hey, welcome. Um, and I called the meeting to order at 6.01. We're recording. Um, yeah, I think that's all we're going to say. All right, so first thing on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the meeting of September 14th, 2020. Uh, Matt, did you, I'm just going to ask you before we do the motion, did you want to vote to approve those or did you want to put them off since you weren't here? I was not here. I know that some people will abstain from voting on minutes. I will, um, if if you're comfortable with them, I'm okay with voting to approve them um, rather than holding off on that. I, okay. have, read, I have read them, so I have an idea, but I was not present at the meeting. All right, perfect. So if you'd like to make a motion. We'll make a motion to approve the minutes. And I'll second. Any discussion? No discussion. All right, Matt, you approve? Lavoie, yes. And Young, yes. All right. All right, big works out of the way. And, and there is good info in there that we'll probably refer back to today as well. Um, especially related to some of the HVAC stuff. Um, it was a pretty good job of just keeping track of what's in there. So, um, All right, so uh, next topic agenda is review of the start of the school year. Um, I had sent out in the materials for the meeting tonight, um, you know, under this, I did want to discuss um, just like a quick update on you know, just how it's going from the administration's viewpoint. A um, couple quick updates just on some budget impacts as it relates to facilities. Um, little explanation on the SPED transportation issues if possible. Um, and then I know Carolyn had sent out to the group um, some notes from the teachers and if we could just Maybe look at that and address that. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of it, but you know, just maybe discuss a topic or two and then um, leave it as items that administration could get back to us on. Sounds so. good. And, and Adam, I, I, I apologize. Um, when we get to that point, um, we, we do have a pretty detailed response. Uh, Daryl can speak to that or I can. One of us will flip a coin, but uh, we, we, did, uh, we do have that for, for tonight, so. You don't okay. need to. You don't need to skirt over it if you don't want to. Okay. All right, perfect. Yeah. So I mean, I guess um, starting off, just uh, from the facility again, you know, just from the facilities and security viewpoint, you know, how has the basically soft open on October fifth to now gone? So yeah, you're right. That's a that's a good way to frame it, Adam. Uh, you know, a soft opening because we're we're bringing in about 165 students, um, you know, across 11 schools, um, with uh, quite a few staff, uh, you know, supporting those students, um, administration, custodial, um, administrative assistants. So uh, people are people are in the building and they're 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 rolling. Um, you know, in terms of uh, an opening, I, I'd have to say that it has been uh, smooth because, you know, we've had so few kids coming in. It's not like we're taking a bus with 24 kids and making sure they're socially distanced as they get off the bus and walk into school. So those are the things that are going to be a little more uh, challenging in terms of rolling out by school. And every school is going to have its own specific protocols in terms of uh, entrances and exits and so forth, but um, you know, in terms of how this has gone so far, I'm knocking on wood. Uh, it, it's it's gone well. Uh, the the um, we've had <laughs> at least one issue associated with uh, you know a parent of a student that tested positive, and um, you know that was something that we had to deal with at seven fifteen, seven thirty in the morning. Uh, so that was one of those. Okay, let's quickly roll this through, uh, figure out what to do, you know, call the Board of Health, uh, make all that happen. And it actually, it actually worked out well. Um, 
and, and you know, I, I just met with the boards of health yesterday and we reviewed it uh, together and it, it's kind of a, a, it was a good case study in terms of uh, how we looked at it in terms of our response. And again, our response as well as that of the board of health was overly cautious. And that's kind of where we're gonna be at uh, moving forward. I'd much rather err on the side of caution than kind of say, oh, you know what, Let, let's just let everything slide and not notify other people. So that was really, you know, where we were at ultimately. So that was a, it was a good way for it to kind of play out. I'm not saying it was good that it happened, but I think the fact that we didn't have a lot of kids in school, we didn't have a lot of staff in there, uh, in in the school building itself, it, it, it did make a difference. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd have to say so far, um, you know, Dan, unless you have anything else, I've, uh, you know, it's been, been it's been good so far yeah <laughs> just want to echo that and um, um, I, I think uh, the challenge again was what what happened um, um, actually my, my phone went off went off about uh, I don't know 10 minutes to seven uh, that day so I, I knew that uh, something was was cooking that day but I I think that uh, people were very responsive and responsible to to what happened and we can always learn and we can always learn to, to do things better um, and uh, I, I think that we, we handled it well. Um, and I, I think it'll be a, a good case study for when the big buses begin to roll and, uh, and, and what, uh, what, what may happen there. So I, I do have a question um, regarding the positive case that we had. Um, I know just- Well, just to interject, that, we, didn't have yeah. a, we didn't have a positive case? Yeah, that's right. I, so it it removed. Yeah. So, and again, I think that's where a lot of the conversation has kind of <laughs> not occurred, but I think that's where a lot of, I think the, and I wouldn't even call it miscommunication, but you, you know, DESE, DPH, uh, the boards of health, they're really, hey, listen, you know, define who that person is, what that person is, whether or not there were people who were close contacts. And then, you know, everyone else is on the periphery. Um, yep. So, Sorry. Okay. No, no, no. That that's fine. Absolutely correct me on that because that that's definitely a case where terminology matters. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I think I think you actually just hit the nail on the head and answered what I was going to say. Um, you know, I think there was definitely a a perception of um, not necessarily knowing who should be notified when and what. You know, even if it was handled and there was like a a set protocol of what needed to happen. Not everybody that felt they were necessarily a stakeholder um, felt that, you know, they knew what was happening. Um, so, you know, it's, and again, like, and I, I think Carolyn mentioned it in what she had sent out earlier that, um, you know, if, if it's something that goes to the board of health, you know, just again, like as the teachers are coming back in and saying like, okay, if such and such happens, you know, the people that need to get notified will get notified um, and it's going to depend on the level of exposure and the, you know just the general risk and the board of health is going to take care of it and you know it'll depend on who has been in contact and all that so you, you may hear that there was an issue but and even if you know who was involved and have seen them the timing works out that it doesn't actually affect you you just so that people are aware that that's how it may play out and like so they don't go Oh my gosh, I saw them in my at risk when you know just the timing works out that it wasn't. Exactly. Yep. Just add a little bit too, and I know I'm sure we got this information earlier, but as we the soft open to like the the real open, the hard open, um, having a clear place for our staff to know who their COVID lead is at each school and then who the COVID lead is for the district, that kind of flow chart is so helpful for them to have. And they, they probably just put it in a back pocket somewhere, but I think that like in your staff, well, that is like the front page. This is your school's COVID lead. Yep. Come from X person. Here's the district COVID lead. If there's a district wide case, it will come from X person. So then you don't have everybody going out in like 20 tangents. Like I know you guys have that, you had to have that, but yep. just there's know who that is. Yes. And, you know, I think one of the things that was uh, interesting because this is a district wide program and there was some communication that occurred through special education. Uh, 
you know, not necessarily through the building in the same way. So uh, those are the types of things that we're looking at. If it had been a typical day when we had our students in and the program was in there, it would have, the communication piece would have been a little different, I'm assuming. So you're, I think you're right. That's, you know, so people understand, okay, no matter what, it's the, it's the principal. They get the notification and then that information goes, uh, you know, up to central office as well. So Okay. Yeah. And, you have a comment? Uh, and it's more just Dr. McCall, you said something that piqued interest. Um, there's going to be, you know, more, more kids in school. There's probably going to be case of either exposure or somebody was exposed on the weekend and you find out later. Um, are we confident that in those cases where you might have to ask somebody to quarantine that we can transition those students to a, assuming their health is fine and they're asymptomatic, but they can be transitioned to be able to access, say, a full remote curriculum for that time if they decide that they're going to quarantine at home for. And that's that's kind of the first piece. And then the second is do we have defined protocols on like cleaning exposed areas? Are those going to be off limits for a defined period of time? Do we have like an area like a gym or something like that, that we then can relocate classes to? These are all things that I think are very possible and pardon my ignorance if it's already been discussed, but I just wanted to make sure that we, we're talking about those things as well. Yeah, yeah those are, Matt, those are perfect questions. Um, Actually, why don't you should put those into my uh, <laughs> the the hundred plus questions that I've received today so far. I, uh, I will that. actually. I will. Those are great. Those are good questions. Um, yeah. I, so when we're talking about you know, in, in some of these things are just examples of how things might happen. So if you have a, a positive, you know, let's just say a student is exhibiting symptoms in a class, they go down to the nurse. The nurse says, uh, you know what? They've got a fever. They've got a cough. Uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to put them into the COVID room. You know, they smock up, they do their stuff. They bring them into the COVID room. We watch them. Parent comes, picks them up, brings the kid home. They test. Uh, the problem is the testing doesn't always happen immediately. You don't mm -hmm. get the results back. So what they say is that, and this is, you know, from the top down, you kind of just keep, you kind of, there's not really, you don't shut the class down. You don't do anything. What you would do is as you would, you know, let's just say a kid's sick with the flu, you would clean that entire area or that class so that it's, uh, you know, at least for that next day, it's, it, it's all set. Um, you know, we have the fogging machines now in uh, the uh, electrostatic sprayers uh, in all of the buildings. And, um, that would go in there immediately. So that would be the first thing. It, and, you know, I think that's a good question, Matt, about, you know, moving students to another space during that time. You know, maybe we say, okay, let's just get them out of there so the exposure is down just in case. Um, I just don't know how many of these we're going to have. That's, you know, if we, if we have three or four kids who are all in, you know, because they're, they're spacing it out and, you know, you have three or four kids in that room, you know, what spaces would they end up going to and how we play that out. So that's, those are great questions. Um, so that's part of it. And, you know, the other part is, you know, as if, if the student, if the information comes back and it's, it's negative, you're being, you're being cautious. So I'd much rather have it that way. If the information comes back and it's positive. The other thing that we, you know, and this is the HIPAA stuff, we can't even technically tell the teacher that the student's positive. Uh, so it's really the, each nurse will have like a, 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 a piece of paper, let's just say, or it's going to be a PDF with the class chart on there with where kids are sitting so that we can see the close contacts. They can have a conversation and, you know, ultimately with the teacher and say, okay, were the, which kids were in school on that day? Or they can check through power school uh, to see, you know, the attendance. And the other piece that we have to talk about is it, it's six feet or under for 15 minutes or more. That's the close contact. And it's with or without a mask. It doesn't matter. When I went through this with the Board of Health yesterday, they said it doesn't matter. You could have a mask on. You could be wearing N95. If you're six feet or under and it's, uh, you know, 10, you know, 15 minutes and that person has tested positive, you're, you're out for 
uh, you know, 10 to 14 days um, based upon their, their, you know, their symptomology. Right. So just one other thing, then we have to think about the nurse's exposure to that, oh. like 15 minutes and, and they have to like take a break away or not expose or have some sort of answer. Yeah. You know what? It, it, and what's interesting is that as I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about the whole concept of, you, let's just say you have a speech teacher working and they're three feet away. And even if there's a divider in front, you're, you're still technically, you know, there's that six foot distance. So even if they get up and they, you know, move over here for a little bit, you know, for, you know, four or five minutes and then come back to the space, a breakaway of some sort. So it's not, uh, you know, a, and, and they say it's not 15 minutes total, it's 15 minutes uh, consecutive. So, uh, you know, we're really looking at, you know, if, if there's a way for us to do it that way. Nurses, I'm, I'm concerned about how that kind of plays out in all honesty, because again, they're going to be on the front line. They're going to be the ones who get, you know, exposed pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, they're going to be dealing with them. But I can tell you, we have so much PPE. Um, we, <laughs> I took a picture. I, I, I won't, put it in but like our curriculum center you know we have boxes that are you know eight feet tall like just probably I don't know how many boxes Dan but you know each school is receiving gloves and masks and more sanitizer and wipes and everything so all of that's going out um, over the next couple of days you know on top of another order so those are the good news. Is there's a there's a ton of stuff uh, that's going out right now uh, to everyone. So, you know, in in preparation for when more kids come on board. There was a <clears throat> there was a, a lodge set up uh, about two weeks ago for every single building, um, and it had a a, a hodgepodge of, of PPE. Uh, there was a delivery that I think Daryl's referring to that came in the other day that has since been. Um, broken out and, and, and dispersed. If you walk into the curriculum center on the right hand side, I'd say maybe six to nine feet walking down the hall, four feet, uh, the box is stacked four feet high. Um, and that, that, that's all been um, dispersed. Uh, uh, there are custodians who have come into the buildings various times of the day to, to pick up uh, uh, what they need. Uh, and PPP from, you know, the, the mask, uh, the hand sanitizer, the face mask, the face shields, uh, the gloves, uh, the, the, the gowns, et cetera. And, uh, uh, I know Deputy Superintendent Burlow will, will be putting through a, a second order in the not too distant future. Adam, do you have a question? Yeah, so, um, so I'm uh, one of the high needs teachers. I work at the preschool, and so our kids have gone back for two hours, and then this week, three hours, and then full days on Monday. And uh, so I feel like we've been a part of figuring out how this works and and what happens if 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 something happens. So, for example, um, a student in our classroom is sick, and we still haven't gotten the results back on whether it's a COVID test. They said that it was a forty-eight hour test, and they, and they don't know. So, I would feel more comfortable if my classroom had been cleaned, like kind of given like a deeper cleaning than normal. But I don't think that there's a clear protocol or system like obviously my nurse and my um you know administrators knew but i didn't tell my custodian so i to my knowledge my room wasn't cleaned any different th differently than normal so i think um it makes complete sense to err on the side of caution and give it an extra you know spray or or whatever but i don't think that right now that system is in place and particularly to extend to a full day. And as more students start coming back to the ECC, um, I think having that, what whatever that flow chart or that system is very clear so everybody knows would really be helpful. Can I just jump in there just for a second? Um, Carolyn, I think this was um, one of the questions that uh, you had raised that you had sent out early this afternoon and, and so i think when we when we get to that if you don't mind adam i, I think uh we we can address that um your your concern um in the response uh that we have uh that that darrow has uh and, and speak with deputy superintendent burlow so sure. happy happy to address that then all right thank you okay um so i think that 
we should maybe move on to, um, I mean, we all know that everything's kind of up in the air regarding enrollment numbers and how that's going to affect us and how Hold Harmless is going to work out next year and all of that. Um, but I guess just in general, um, you know, how are we looking even this fiscal year and next fiscal year looking at funding for the extra PPE, the cleaning, um, time, transportation, and all that that we're looking at? You know, just is there anything related to facilities, safety, security of the so I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that for a second and Daryl, feel yeah. free to jump in. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I've told Daryl is that um, given the, the huge unknown for next year is that uh, we need to continue, the key word is continue to, to build my term, this is my term now, um, our own rainy day fund, um, if you will. And, and by that, I mean a, a fund where we have the ability to access funds um, rather easily. As you know, uh, we brought forward this year a, a million dollars in circuit breaker. And again, this, I think uh, last year was the first time, but this year was the first time that that has happened. Granted, you know, we were out for a quarter of the year, but still, I mean, there, there was some planning involved to, to make that happen. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we did, um, Adam, Matt, and, and Carolyn, um, and Megan, um, is um, prior to receiving uh, the various grants that, that we are in receipt of. And, and the big one, for example, the school reopening grant, the, the almost 1.6 million, the 1572 and change, um, is that, that we use school choice um, as the means, as, as a funding source to, to get a jump start. Um, on a lot of the ordering and, and then when when the grants came in because these grants are retroactive back to back to last march um is that when when the grants came in and they were you know fairly recent in the past uh, couple of weeks that uh, we we could um, uh, make the adjustments out of school choice um in, into the grant but but the point is is that you know as we move forward I, I, we need to be strategic and um as i often say to daryl probably every other day is that we got a we got a um um, build our financial resources and we get it we, we have to if we can um, to bring forward a sum of money next year both in, in school choice and in circuit breaker because uh, we don't know what's in store for, for next year we, we really don't um, and um, you know the SOA was postponed this year um, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be implemented next year keyword is supposed to um, and that may not happen either Daryl was checking and that, that may not happen mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, you know, when you, when you just look at our chapter 70, you know, the, the governor's numbers back in January reflected the, the SOA, you know, $411,000. And when the new numbers came out a week or so ago, you know, um, they, they validated that it's gone, you know, 408000 um, You know, we got our, we got our circuit breaker numbers uh, um, for, for, for this year, just, just last Friday. And, and the SOA was supposed to be in that as well um, for transportation, for sped transportation, 25%. And then they were going to phase it in. Well, that's out the window as well. So there are so many unknowns next year. Um, I think what we can do is we, we need to control what we can't control to the best of our ability, which is to um, have a, a, a sum of money um, that will allow us the, the ability come next year to tackle some of these the, these issues. Because we don't know if this, we, we hope knock on a desk that uh, there'll be a second stimulus plan um, after the election or even next year, but but we don't know that yet. Yeah. Yeah, and I can just jump in. From what you know, I was able to hear on the radio today, I think um, Mitch McConnell basically told the White House not to do anything right now uh, in terms of making a, you know, any type of connection or proposition um, toward having some type of stimulus package uh, with um, Nancy Pelosi in, in that group. So that that's going to push it off. Um, and Dan, Dan and I talked about this today at length. Um, you know, we have to, we do have to think about next year, but at the same time, we still need to provide for this year. That's, that's you know, a, a big part of what, you know, I don't want to shortchange kids or staff. I, I don't want to put anyone at risk uh, because we don't have PPE or, you know, we're not following certain protocols because we don't have the funds. So, um, you know, I have to look at it. Yeah, I do have to look at it long term. And we are, you know, we're taking that into consideration, but we still want to ensure that we have everything that we need. So could that be a, uh, an, an issue? I think what's going to happen is it's going to have to be something that's put forth associated with FY22. Because remember, FY22, 
like I'm supposed to have my meetings <laughs> with the five <laughs> towns like the second week of November typically around the budget and talk about you know so you know the the five town hearing that we have in Holden typically uh, at the senior center you know we don't even have a budget for this year I think what will happen though is there will be um, a concerted effort and, and as Dan said you know the transportation stuff's going to be out the window that increase I do not think we're going to see any more SOA money next year um, in fact I would bet a lot of money and we're not going to see any SOA money but with that being said, I think they're going to have to put aside um, money associated with, uh, you know, the necessary COVID materials, PPE, uh, support systems financially for each district. Uh, because, again, it's something that we now we, we got to roll it in. Uh, you know, we're, we've been dependent upon the stimulus money to help out. And it's been fantastic. One of the issues that we're dealing with that all districts are dealing with is that the money has to be spent by December 31st. We can't carry it over. Um, you know, the, the 1.6, the $1.57 million. So that, that is an issue in and of itself. So, you know, we, I think we, we talk about it a little bit and I, I think some of the questions that, you know, we had responded to that it sent out, but it's, you know, purchasing things, knowing that we're going to need them next year as well. Uh, you, right. you know, part of it is, you know, stocking up on the stuff that, Again, we don't know how much we're going to go through. We don't know. Uh, it, you know, we we have half the kids in. Maybe somewhere down this year, down the road, we get all the kids in. Maybe somewhere down the road, everybody's remote again for a long time. We don't know. The way it's trending right now, it's not it's it's not trending well uh, in terms of the state. Um, you know, locally, I think it. You know, we we might be okay for a while, but you know, every to the east of us, it, it's it's getting really tough. So. Okay. Um, one of the other things, uh, Christine Smith sent out an email this week um, explaining how the, the phase 1.5 for everywhere except the ECC isn't really going to happen. Um, and it was, it was almost strictly due to transportation issues. So I, I know within that it said, you know, we're working with the transportation company um, coming up with um, they're hiring new people and all that, um, but you know, I guess you know, that came out recently, but how far along are we? Are we really confident they're going to have 100%? Are they going to be close? You know, are we looking pretty good? So we, we have, um, there were 28 vans <coughs> or vehicles um, that we began to use um, on, on October 5th. And um, um, as we approach the, uh, the, the 26th, we're, we're going to increase that to uh, approximately uh, 35. Um, there, uh, there, there is no issue with the equipment in, in, in retaining the equipment, um, at least as of now, unless, unless there's a surprise coming that we don't know about. Um, there have been some challenges with, with, with staff, but um, we're uh, with, with transportation staff. Uh, um, but um, um, you know, Ron Ernan Wine is, is very confident that that we'll be be good to go um, um, with the additional equipment uh, in, in in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, again, we he can't control the staff, and if, pe if people become ill, then you know that's an unfortunate uh, um, issue. Okay. Um, and, and the way I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, it, it's a bigger impact to the SPED transportation because we're servicing everybody, whereas we're able to plan out, you know, the hybrid based on the buses for the big yellow buses, right? Like yep. we, we don't expect as much of an issue. Exactly. So we, <clears throat> what, what AA did was, um, he swapped out some of the small vehicles. He he was able to pick up some some transit vans, uh, larger vehicles um, that we were able, or he'll be able to transport students and still maintain the social distancing. And and, and those are booked. Um, those are signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, um, I worked that out with Ron. I'll, I'll say three weeks ago, but don't tell me the exact time. All the days seem to run together. Um, and and we've confirmed we've confirmed those vehicles for the balance of the year. 
um, and, and frankly, you know, even moving forward for, for next year if, if necessary. Um, but uh, again, we've, um, um, I, I feel that we've, we've worked out uh, the kinks um, in terms of the vehicles and, and the number of vehicles and, and the students that uh, can be transported um, on those vehicles. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions or anything on what we've done over so far? Comments, concerns? No. Um, so I think, you know, let's stay on the start of the school year and move into uh, what Carolyn had sent out earlier today, if that works. Um, so I don't know, you said you had like prepared responses for this or do you you've got it Daryl right or I mean I've got it too. Do you want me to present it? Um, would it help if I just present what she has written on the screen? Okay. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Thank you, Adam. All right, let me figure that out. <laughs> it's not easy on Google Meets. All right, so should we able to do the window? Yeah, the hard part is going back and forth be between screens. So I open up a window and then I lose the ability to unmute myself or? Yeah, it's wacky. Uh, well, I, I have the benefit of working with three screens. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm cheating a little bit. Well, well, well. OK, nice. You need, you need the two screens at least, though. I'm with Adam on that one. Well, that's it. I, I use two screens, but you know, the laptop's got the camera, so I have a, th have a third whenever I'm doing video meetings. All right. So can you guys see it? Yes. Zoom good? All right. All right. So um, it seems like just some questions on you know, how the system of PPE distribution goes. Um, you know, questions over who was basically issued boxes and who had to go and ask for it, um, things like that. So, yep. So, in, good question. Uh, you know, again, one of the things as we kind of roll this out, we we're trying to uh, you know follow DESI guidelines associated with um, a, a number per week per staff member. Uh, or per student. So those are the things that are going out there. You know, there are always requests for probably more things. Um, and, you know, we're trying to provide what we can provide, but um, you know, again, those items are, are coming into the high school. So it gets delivered up to the high school because typically it's, a, it's an awful lot of stuff and, and we do not have a, um, a place where you can take out a forklift and drop things off at central office. So unfortunately it all goes up to the high school and the facilities manager up there, Mark Wilde is doing a great job just taking it all and helping to organize it. Um, so, you know, what we've done is that, you know, Bob has been working with our facilities manager, Jim Cavello, um, whose time, again, we, we reduced his, his position um, because of the budget cuts. And um, he's literally kind of said, okay, here are the things that are going out. So he and Jim uh, have been organizing like the, the stuff that went out uh, or that's going out this week. Um, and it's systematic. Uh, they have a kind of system for how it gets played out. And um, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be good to go. And as Dan mentioned, we're, we'll have another order going in um, based upon, you know, what we've already put out there and, you know, the way the way Desi has broken it down, it's really out of a three month window. So they're like, okay, do three months at a time. So when you're ordering three months at a when you order three months at a time for thirteen schools, it's a lot of it's a lot of PPE. Dan, I think you're talking. Yep. You yep. Got it. Sorry about that. Yeah. So um, also uh, just a couple things. Um, um, Bob Burlow is um, happy to create a, a virtual Q&A um, if, if necessary. And um, he's, he's happy to do um, a meeting as well of whatever uh, people are looking for. Um, Adam, I'm gonna send you a document and maybe you can put it up there as well. I, I've, got a, um, I've got an Excel document here that has a breakout of, 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 of PPE supplies uh, 
for all the buildings. So let me get that to you in a nanosecond. And and um, uh, before we go too far down in these questions, you can just put it up there so folks can see um, what's um, what's been audited to date for the buildings. Can you just give me a second? And I should have said this. Yeah, yeah. I just want to offer a, a question about the PPE. I, I think the concern is more so with how you get it or what system you get it within your building because the buildings seem to vary like some buildings um you know the the principal or you know the administration holds on to it and then gives out a box at a time whereas other people you know kind of get what you need and i think that is more um causing some concern for staff members because they certainly for related service providers, which might be in different buildings, they don't know how to get this stuff and it doesn't seem to be clear um, across principles. So I think that's where the breakdown comes down and, and some of the anxiety. So there were um, four dispersals of PPEs, um, Carolyn sent um, uh, to, to the buildings. Um, I, I guess one of the concerns is, you know, what happens when they get to the buildings, um, uh, the principals uh, are the gatekeepers, if you will, and um, um, they do know in advance um, what they're getting and, and also what, what's, uh, what's intended um, um, for their building. Um, there was an issue early on with uh, wipes, um, and uh, they, they were in back order, um, and uh, it's my understanding now that um, there's about 14,000 wipes uh, that uh, are being sent out uh, to to the buildings. Um, Bob will continue to work with the principals uh, to, to ensure that um, if there is a hiccup here with any of, of the disbursement of other materials that, you know, that that hiccup um, gets uh, negated uh, um, immediately. <clears throat> Did you get my email, Adam? Yeah, I'm, I'm just about to that. Um, and this was as of October 5th, so it was a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Everybody see it? Um, so this, okay, so this is for the October 5th, um, like two teachers at Mount View, one at Nate Quag, so it's not full numbers. Okay. Right, this is relative to special education. Okay. Right. Um, So this gives you a listing of, of the items in the units per item um, and also the location as to where it, it should have gone. Um, and uh, again, um, if, if, if they didn't get to that location, then there's probably just a, a breakdown within that building. So I, I, I mean, I guess that leads to the question, if there is um if if teachers are having trouble like i don't have a mask today to wear or something like that like yeah or, or they don't have whatever it's just go to their building principal and you know work it out and figure out like what they need yeah. to get and so that's their yeah principals aren't going to keep ppe from people right. i think one of the things is as, as you know I, here's what i liken it to um and carolyn you've been around long enough to probably remember this um w when paper got distributed uh, when we went back through our, um, you know, the, I can't even think of the name of the program that we put forth, but, whew, it, and part of it was, I think principals would distribute reams of paper at a time. Some did that. Some said, you know what, I trust you. Go through, you know, just take what you need. Unfortunately, for the ones that got distributed, well, for the ones that where they said, hey, just, I'm going to leave it in the office room, the back room, go get it if you need it. It, you know, by January, typically that paper was all gone. And it partly due because people were kind of hoarding. So the nice thing that Dan's done, and this is what, you know, we have every class has X number of things for X number of kids 
uh, you know, based upon, you know, what Desi says, you know, we sh we should be presenting. So that should be that should be all set. I'm not. Sh my guess is, Carolyn, like you said, it might be the itinerant service providers who might be running into this issue more than it, more than someone that has his or her own classroom. So I think so. Okay. So and I think that's something that has to be dealt with in terms of not just not just the building principal because that, they're itinerant. It's got to be through our special education office in conjunction with, uh, you know, Dan and Bob and, uh, and building principals, but the, you know, because building principals don't own those people typically. Okay. So I think, so maybe that is just something Yeah, maybe in the like WR is it so would they fall into this WRSD providers line? Is that like people that are the ones that hop around or so let me uh one second. Those are the um I guess what I would call the itinerants, uh, those would be the, the therapists, the, cl the clinical staff. Um, yeah, okay. I, I guess uh, uh, who go from building to building. Okay, so they, they need to kind of work through the special ed department and look at yep. and more stuff. Will, they may need to swing by central office to pick theirs up or figure out a time to do that or a way to do that. Okay. All right. And um, I, I guess if, if there's someone who's lacking something um, in, in their district wide, um, I would ask that they reach out to Deputy Superintendent Burlow um, and, he, and he can coordinate uh, a pickup time and he can coordinate uh, whatever they need. Okay. They should reach out directly to Bob Burlow or Chris Smith or who? If it's not building based, if, if it is an itinerant person, they, they should um, contact Deputy Superintendent Burlow. Okay. Okay. I have just a quick question. I know that this is for um, people who are back already, but something like just for instance, face shields, one per staff, and there's you know 14 staff members, 14 face shields. Are we equipping each school with some extra inventory? So in a case where something happens during the day that a teacher has access to that, or is there a process in place to do that? Because that's one area I look at and I say, those are the things that could happen. Someone loses it, steps on it, breaks it, what have you. It's, um, I just want to make sure that we are giving our teachers and the support staff what they need to be able to provide in-person education. Right, Matt, I, I don't have the exact number in, in terms of the inventory. You certainly can check on that. But I, as, as we've talked about you know, tonight, um, you know, uh, we are going to be putting through another pretty comprehensive um, order of uh, materials, uh, uh, so I can, you know, check on the, the face shields to see what what is in stock. Just anything, anything that I think is one per, I think is just to make sure that there's there's a mechanism in place that people can get access to that, so it doesn't impact the day. Whether it's having a couple extra on or more. On. Yeah, I, I can tell you, um, Matt, that. You know, our health offices are, are well stocked um, as well. So uh, there are extra PPE items uh, just just in case uh, for those types of things. Um, yeah, gowns, gloves, uh, masks, shields, um, you know, anything that would require, you know, that's really necessary in, in, in oh. terms of dealing with anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, like, I mean, in, in a few short weeks, you know, all these numbers are going to go way up. So yeah, this is all, this is just the snapshot from a few weeks ago. And we need to, you know, once November rolls around, stuff will be filling up tons of space in each school. So, okay. 
All right. Um, I'm going to try to switch back now. But the uh, so I mean, actually, the the next thing was you know related to cleaning, um, and a little bit related to the kind of the same issues of what seemed to be a, either a inconsistent delivery or the perception of an inconsistent delivery, um, and just not necessarily seeing or being aware of what's happening when or you know is this stuff there for the long term and there's just kind of the short term right now. And, you know, Carolyn, feel free to jump in and speak to it. You know, it's, I'm just reading it and summarizing no, you it. You nailed so. it. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> in terms of the wipes, I think people panic because the wipes themselves are, are a small package. So people just get nervous that they're going to run out. Um, oh. And so I think it's just, um, I, and I don't know if it's because some people aren't feeling reassured by their principles. I, I think it's, I think it definitely varies by school. Um, Cause I, I've heard from other members that have felt very, you know, very comfortable and have worked very well with their um, principles. Um, so but the work is just a concern. So oh, as I said a moment ago, you know, the, the wipes, they, they were on back order. And, and, and please um, keep in mind that every school district across the nation, um, every city and town, we're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to get a, a trillion wipes and face mask and hand sanitizer and, and the full nine yards. Um, so uh, there are Dan, can I, sure. Dan, can, I, can I jump in on this? Because I, I have the list of, of what's... So it's so these are the these are the items that we talked about that um, are ready to go in the curriculum center that are going to be picked up um, over the next day or two. So it's 400 uh, medical gloves for nurses, 80 um, uh, they're the black nitrile gloves for custodians, uh, 100 canisters of surface wipes, so over 14,000, uh, 144 hand sanitizer bottles, 8,000 disposable masks for teachers. Um, and some backups for larger students, um, 500 child masks and more backups for students for elementary sites, um, tw at least 24 cans of uh, disinfectant spray that's used only for emergency cleanup, um, 10, and Matt, this is what some of the things we were talking about, the 10 hard shields, you know, for schools. These are what, you know, is coming to each school. Uh, 25 level two gowns, um, a, a trash receptacle for the nurse nurses waiting room. So. That's that is what is being sh shared. That's you know ready to go. So what's happening is as we get that, we you, you know we collect it and then we put it all together, have it ready to go. Custodians, uh, principals, you know whoever wants to do it comes and picks it up, and then um, you know they distribute it or they hold on to it and they they distribute it by you know you know necessity I, I guess. So all of those things are on top of everything else that you know, was already kind of been been put in place. Okay. I mean I think I think the general idea that I'm getting from this is we're we're really close to people having the perception of scarcity which if you have the perception of scarcity then everybody just tries to start grabbing what they can so that they make sure they have enough and then we have actual scarcity. Right. <laughs> We found that in every grocery store this spring. Like, <laughs> there was plenty of food to go around. Just everybody panicked and bought it all. And you know, it's the supply chain's only so long. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, within this group, you know, now we're kind of on the same page that, you know, we have the supplies we need in stock and ready to go and we're ready to roll them out as it's needed. So it's not taking up space somewhere else. But, make sure that message gets out there and you know, either through um even if it's just an update to teachers in an email or a, a wednesday pd day or something like that just uh you know just get the message out there that you know as you're coming in you know this is the stuff that's going to be rolling out you're not going to get all of it for several months at once um but we're going right. to be issuing it to you and make sure that you have enough on hand for you know, whatever that time frame is you're looking at. So so that they know if I've got two weeks on hand, you know, like I'm not gonna have any after two weeks. Like, no, no, more is coming. <laughs> you know, and you should expect it every 
so often, you know, however you're going to run that. That's yes. kind of the, just the general idea I'm getting from the whole document. So. Um, there is this concern about the disinfectant spray and, um, you know, warnings on when and when not to spray it. And I mean, just a couple of things I'd point out is one, if you can find Lysol spray, good luck, grab it. Yeah. Um, I've, I've found two bottles since March. There you go. We'll go, go steal from Matt. Uh, <laughs> I did see Home Depot has their HDX brand, which is almost exactly the same, smells the same, and they had tons of it. But, um, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, what, what are the concerns with what is being distributed? Are there, you know, significant health concerns or is it um, kind of the same um, I mean, health concerns? As in regard to the disinfectant, it's more that people don't want to use it because it's, uh, I mean, it just, it smells toxic. And um, in my classroom in particular, I need to disin we need to dis disinfect things during the day while the kids are there. So yeah. there's just no reasonable way we could use it. So people um, brought in Lysol from home and I did talk with central office about it. And, and the response was absolutely, we would love to buy you an alternative, but we don't know where to get one. Um, so I, I think this is um, this is more of a long-term issue that the disinfectant that we do have, it doesn't, I, I don't know that it's a good option. So um, for the future, we need to figure out an alternative. And just, just to, as a point of clarity, um, on the disinfectant spray that, that, that does exist, um, um, its intent um, is to respond to um, contamination. Um, it, it, it's not intended. Um, for for daily cleanup, um, yep, it's it's strong. Um, it is strong, and the reason why it's strong is is so that um, it can kill uh, viruses. Um, and and certainly, and I think that you you said this, uh, Carolyn, uh, your colleagues and, and teachers um, shouldn't be using it um, uh, if they're not uh, uh, comfortable with uh, with using it. Uh, and, and again, um, it, it it's not intended. Um, uh, to be used as a daily cleaner, but rather to address uh, um, contamination. So, th so th it does beg the question. Okay, so then what do we what do we use? And, and I think you you answered that as well. Is that we're, we're trying to figure that out. Number one, and then trying to find it. Number two, and again, it comes back to trying to find product because the whole world is 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 looking for the same for the same product. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have any, any good comments on that. Um, yeah, so it sounds like, you know, what we have is, and I'm just repeating what you said, but, you know, it's intended for that. We have an identified issue and that's what we're going in and sanitizing for. So are the... <laughs> Is, is each room getting like cleaned with some sort of disinfectant every day? Or is it just a standard wipe down the desk cleaning? Is the wipe down the desk, whatever we're using, um, something that is an antibacterial or something like that? Um, you know, I guess what, or an antiviral, um, you know, what, because otherwise, otherwise people are going to be using disinfectants every day. Because um, I, don't, I don't see them not doing that. Um, so this is something that, one, it addresses the proper in instruction of use of the equipment provided. So it's not being used every day. And then, two, what, what can we do to address the, the need to clean every day? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. All right, so um, I want to move a little quicker, but you know, cleaning schedule, um, is it happening every day? Is for the high touch areas, is deep cleaning happening midweek and on weekends? Um, and then 
carpet cleaners, what's going on with that, and how to vote, when and how does foggers get used? So um, there, there is a, a daily schedule of cleaning, and this is something that, again, um, Deputy Superintendent Burlow worked out uh, with, with the principals. So the principals are, are, are aware of the schedule. Um, and it's, you know, I guess it's not something that, that, that they make public. Um, bathrooms um, are hit or should be hit um, at least twice, if not, if not um, three times a day um, as part of that uh, schedule. And, and again, the, the burden rests with, with the respective principal to ensure that that schedule is, is being adhered to. Um, in terms of the cop, oh, what, what? In terms of the copper cleaner, our copper cleaners, um, those are being ordered. Um, and there is a uh, fogger um, in over at ECC um, that can be used to sanitize uh, the carpet in, in the interim. And uh, again, I'm not sure if Sean, who's a custodian over there in the afternoons, or, or if the gentleman in the morning is, is aware of that. Um, and uh, but but there is a, a short-term fix uh, for that, Carolyn, until uh, the uh, the product um, arrives uh, in the next couple of weeks. Would you agree on weekly? I'm sorry, I, I missed you there. Would you agree that uh, the carpet sanitizing um, or the fogger could be done weekly, particularly in a room that has these kind of low. Um, uh, like special needs, um, you know, not wearing masks, et cetera. So I'd have to look at the product, but I, but I think a, a weekly um, sanitizing is is adequate, um, Carolyn. And let, let's do this. Um, I'll 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 check on it tomorrow morning, and um, I'll I'll track you down, or I'll track down um, Andrew, and we'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, HVAC, um, yeah, what, so I guess what is the protocol per building for how thermostats should be used? Um, when there's an issue with HVAC, who gets told about it? Um, you know, what's that protocol? Um, and then a recommendation to do a, a virtual Q and A with teachers to review the HVAC results uh, moving forward. Yeah, so the protocols are, are by building. So when we when we talk about that, because each building is different. So talk about a place like Mount View, where you, you, you don't want to open windows. Uh, and then you talk about a place that um, doesn't have the same, you know, an older, older building, maybe doesn't have the same circulation air circulation and uh, if that if the airflow isn't um, adequate then yeah you know windows are windows are used um, when we're talking about because that's that's all part of the the different types of air conditioning system so th there's no one one size fits all uh, for that you know across the board um, so it's very different by building uh, you know if there is a, an issue you know the other thing that that can happen I think everyone, because you know, they're going around, they're testing, they're sampling different places. You know, the ATC company that is, did the initial sampling with special education, and now they're sam they they finished sampling um, probably another eighty spaces, give or take, throughout the district, including large places like gymnasiums and cafeterias. Uh, it, that information will come back, and that's just going to be a report that we put out there. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll share it with this group and, you know, we'll post it to the website. It's all, you know, it's all public information. Uh, and what it'll do is just kind of say, okay, here are the places that might need some support, might need, you know, some modification in the same way that uh, they, they did for the other one. And then all these other places, you know, check, 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 you know, they're good to go. Again, one of the things that we look at with this is, you know, in a, in a perfect world, if we were a district where money was no object, I guess we could say, sure, let's send that ATC company into every single classroom and space throughout the district. It would cost us five, six hundred thousand dollars. 
to do that. Most districts aren't doing that. They're doing a sampling and they're saying, okay, this is this is basically a sample of what uh, an example of you know what what might work, what might not work. What you know, again, we have our own HVAC person who is literally going around and looking at all of these, you know, making sure they work. We had crews up on the roof over at ECC today taking care of some of the blowers that were making noise because we're turning, you know, the blowers are running. So we want to ensure that the exhaust fans are moving. So when they're in the past, teachers have said, oh, can you shut that off? Cause it's too loud. And they didn't really care about air circulation in the same way. Now it's like, oh, wait a sec, we want the air circulation. You turn it on, it sounds like a helicopter. So, um, and you know, I could hear it in my office, <laughs> which is across the, the way it's not even connected it's connected to the building but across the way so they were up there fixing that today thermostats are getting fixed those are those are coming in that's just a, a replacement of thermostats in places like ecc um but again i think once we get that report back next week uh we'll be looking at uh, another okay round of you know all hands on deck to to fix things before uh, the 18th because again we want to ensure that whatever spaces that we're using they're they're good to go for for staff um, it's, you know, what people have to understand is they're not going into every space. The, the company isn't, they're not going to give a report for, um, every space in a building. So. And, uh, the, about the air purifiers, do you have any information on that? What's the question on the air purifier? So um, you had mentioned that their air purifiers, they cost like $200. So maybe for um, high frequency areas or for specific rooms where there's an additional concern. Um, so in, um, so I had said, uh, I had um, requested two uh, for the ABA programs at the ECC because the kids don't wear masks, et cetera. Um, so I wasn't sure when those were be when those were arriving and how they would be distributed. So I'm pretty sure we have some already, um, but, but I can also tell you they are, air purifiers are very, very hard to come by right now um, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, everyone, everyone under the sun is looking for them for their homes and also for um, schools and building spaces and so forth. But I'm pretty sure we already have some, Carolyn, um, and whether or not that was one that, you know, got lost in, in the mix, but um, Dan can look into that tomorrow. Okay, thank you. And, and Carolyn, just, just quickly on the air purifies, um, they're not the, the be all end all. They they don't solve um, all the problems. Uh, there are some in in some classrooms, uh, but that's um, where they're now located is is if there is a teacher who has a, a medical issue or, or a medical concern. Um, as Daryl said, uh, we we can check on that. Um, and again, that's one of those items where um, they too are in, are in pretty high demand. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. Um. I think we discussed a lot of this, the positive case, what happens if there is one, um, you know, the clear protocol. And again, this is, you know, as people come in, just more training on this, you know, what do you do? Who's that contact they have to go to? Make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, and then, you know, let, you know, just from what we've talked about tonight, also let people know that even though you may know of a situation, you may not get direct communication because we either can't tell you something due to privacy issues or just the way it's working. You know, it we're telling the people that absolutely need to know, and you know, so there, there's a level of trust that needs to be there that they know that that's happening too. So, um, I think one of the things, like you said, Adam, is uh, we have we have great um, relationships with our boards of health. And all of the nurses um, reach out to them. Um, they've already started that process as, as we've gone through this. So, um, it, it, you know, our relationship with them is such that I, I, I really feel as though once we kind of have that, and there and there's an understanding of how things kind of play out. We're we're not going to put anyone's health in jeopardy, um, and that's purely like, to, you know, okay, board of health. I want to make sure we're doing this right. They give us the feedback, and then we just say, okay, here's how it's going to play out. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to screw up saying this word, but attest, attestation forms. I don't know. I can't say that word. Attestation. Um, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> just doesn't sound right. Um, so, you know, staff are filling them out every day on power school. Um, you know, our family is going to be doing something daily, weekly, um, and also yeah. making sure that they know you travel outside of mass, like you got to follow the guidelines returning as well. Yes. Yeah. So all of that's going to be um, kind of shared with families as we as we get closer to a uh, full reopening. Uh, the, the travel outside of mass is uh, one that I think a lot of places are concerned about over Thanksgiving and then also mm -hmm. over de the December break, uh, because, um, again, you know, we're we're ticking up, but we're nowhere near some of the other places uh, in, in the United States in terms of kind of the, the overall rate of positivity associated with COVID. So we're concerned in the, in the Northeast, um, you know, about that quite a bit. And I know a lot of districts are concerned about it as well. So yeah, that's all information that we'll be putting out there for families beforehand. Okay. All right. Before we move on from, yeah, from the current reopening, you know, October 5th, Anybody have any other questions, comments? I just had uh, one um, yep. one follow up question. Um, I wasn't clear about the the deep cleaning. I feel like early on it became um, uh, correlated with Wednesdays, um, but it's not exactly clear, particularly for me being in the building. Um, all week if a deep cleaning is actually happening. So is that part of the cleaning system that the principals are aware of? Yeah, so what's gonna happen is, is, is you know, again, it, it's a little different, Carolyn, with the small classes, you, you know, coming in right now, we're not talking full building. So, uh, you know, really the way we're looking at having this play out is they, they will be doing the, the, you know, the sanitizing associated with the um, sprayers. Uh, it, it will be, you know, by deep, um, you know, I, I think that's uh, maybe maybe not the most perfect term, but it's really uh, it, you know hit up hit up the spaces uh, that don't that aren't hit up frequently. So like you know, I know over at um, over at ECC, ECC, uh, you know, even in our office, we now have a halftime custodian, and you know he spends you know the first part of the morning literally going around and wiping down every surface you know that people touch door door handle. Um, you know, throughout throughout the entire building in in the central office area. So, you know, we've got the high touch areas that people are going to be responsible for. And then, you know, a little more of the deep cleaning associated with places like you know, again, locker rooms aren't going to be used, but places like bathrooms, uh, places like it, it, maybe for a place that has carpeting, um, you know, we we would do that. Uh, so we we have two places where we have a lot of carpet. Um, one is the high school and the other is one building, which is Sterling, the Houghton Choxit, uh, those two schools. And, you know, that's where you have, you have more carpet than probably all of the other buildings combined. And, you know, so that'll be an area where, you know, those are cleaned probably once a week. And, you know, and that's going to be a, you know, either a Friday night, maybe a Wednesday. Um, you know, one of the things that we'll do is we'll give teachers the opportunity not to, they don't have to be in, this, in their classrooms. They can, they can leave, you know, at that dismissal time on those Wednesdays. So we can hit up spaces a little differently. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so what I'd like to do is move on to um, discussion of facility and infrastructure requirements. A lot of it's focused on HVAC issues. Um, I've got the report here. Um, then also, just so everybody else is aware, um, let me see if I can find it. I did have, um, when Daryl sent this to me, um, you know, I, I read, read through it. Um, you know, he had said that, you know, there were three major issues identified. Those were taken care of. Um, I did 
question, there were three other issues. Um, and I believe it was these exhaust requires maintenance. Um, yeah, and you know, he said that you know th those were minor things that was related to um, belts and things, and those had already been taken care of. Um, so just to let you know, you know, any conversations I had had prior to the meeting today. Um, but you know, if you want to. Dr. McCall, if you just want to give a, a real quick sure. overview of what they did, how it went, and then we have questions. So, let me know. So, um, you know, basically, you, you know, this firm, um, they're industrial hygienists. They, uh, it, you know, they they actually go in. They do. Um, they assess the the air in reference to um, the movement of the air. So it's basically the rate per hour in which the air circulates throughout a room. Um, and they also look at CO2 and those types of things. So when we ask them to take a look at this, this is what they're doing in schools throughout the Commonwealth, probably throughout the country. So um, if you look at, the, you know, for example, um, Jefferson Early Childhood, the yellow room, the wall-mounted uh, air handling unit had a low fresh air intake flow and should be serviced. So we found out that there was a bookshelf in front of uh, the actual intake. So um, as soon as that got moved, that was resolved. Uh, Paxton Center School, those two items, room 200 and 201, those tied back to a um, the, the pneumatic system and we had just replaced the compressor. And that was, they tested on a time when it was being um, tested so the airflow was really low. So, in, and it only hit those two rooms for some reason. And uh, so they were good to go there. Um, but actually, no, I'm sorry. It it, that would have been the entire building. It was all like that because that was when they were switching over the air compressor because we just changed all of the lines in Paxton Center School. Uh, it, you know, and then if you look at the other ones, those are just spaces that they tested um, and it's, Airflow, um, fresh air airflow was uh, acceptable. And they, they really looked at that across the board. As Adam mentioned, uh, those two spaces require maintenance. Those are things like tightening belts. So the airflow was fine, but it might've been a little noisy. Belts might've been, you know, squeaky, whatever it is. That Those are things that happen. Same with uh, uh, Davis Hill. Um, but again, when, when we were looking at, when we're looking at this, we're focusing on total and fresh air is acceptable. That's the that's the highlight for us. Anything that so the way this is going to break down when we move forward, they'll produce something like this for all of the buildings and X number of rooms in each of the buildings. We will hone in on the spaces that have uh, a room. Let's just say Wachusett room J one hundred nine. If that said airflow low, somewhat acceptable or whatever the terminology would be. That would be the one that we'd hit. If this said total and fresh airflow are acceptable, uh, exhaust fan needs service. You know what? We'll get to that. But right now we know that it's good to go. It works. It's safe. The airflow is fine. Um, that's how we're going to end up doing this moving forward because we don't know how many rooms. You know, we we have an idea, but you know, we don't know how many are going to come back perfect based upon the assessments that they do because they do. They're in. They're outside where the exhaust fan is. So they actually have to, you know, they're inside and outside. It's, it's a pretty thorough uh, test. And our person can do it, but we have, we have one person, and that person's responsible for doing that, but he's also responsible for overseeing how the uh, HVAC systems uh, are, are fixed. And, you know, he's the one that'll come in and, you know, help take care of things at ECC or over at Paxson. Or, so, um, again, we're, putting a lot of time and energy into that. So we're, we're pretty happy with how the, the entire presentation was shared with us. Uh, I know when I shared this with the teachers union, they were happy with this report. They said it was very thorough and ultimately, um, you, you know, one that they could easily accept uh, in terms of looking at the totality of what they did. So that was, that was also very good news for us. Yeah. We just want to ensure that whatever we're, we're bringing kids in and we're bringing, um, 
staff in, those spaces have adequate airflow and um, we're, we're putting them in a safe environment. All right. Anybody have any questions, comments, concerns about the report or anything else related to HVAC? Um, I, know, I know we've come a long way since the beginning of the school year when we had a, a pretty big list of issues and, and we saw it, um, you know, like pneumatic lines in quite a few schools leaking, needing to be replaced, things like that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, definitely any questions, concerns, or concerns about the upcoming report as well? Nope. All right. Thanks. Um, so I guess, um, you know, this covered 11 out of the 13 schools, right? Um, in the other two, and I can't even pick out which ones they are right now, but you know, are, th are there any other issues that we foresee coming up, Daryl? Um, so the other two schools are Mayo and Thomas Prince. They, both of those schools don't have programs. So uh, okay. again, they were assessed over the past you know, week and a half. Uh, they finished up the assessments, you know, ATC finished up their assessments uh, on the 15th. So, you know, Again, we'll we'll know a little bit um, more information later on, but you know, I'm I'm hoping that uh, you know as we kind of go through this and we take a look at some of these spaces, we're we're going to find that it, you know for the most part the airflow is good. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of opening a damper. Sometimes it's a matter of just turning up the motor. <laughs> you know, ha having it run at a at a higher rate. Um, so those are you know those are really the things that we're looking at, and as we move forward. You know, again, it's it's one thing to have great airflow. We also want to ensure that the heat's working uh, at the same time. So mm -hmm. there's that there's always that fine balance. Sometimes it works too well, i.e., ECC. Other times it works you know not well enough uh, in some of the schools where uh, you know, like for example, like the the gym at Central Tree. I know um, the heat doesn't work there. You know, fantastic. So um, again, that's another level of looking at how we're how we're kind of dealing with this as well. Okay. Yeah, and I know just looking at the notes, um, I couldn't find Thomas Prince, um, but I know Mayo was, um, there wasn't any immediate mechanical issues. Um, sometime, I think it was over the winter, the town's replacing the time clock control with computer control. Yep. Um, then there were troubleshooting an electrical issue with some exhaust fans. Yep. Um, Same thing at Thomas Prince. I think that it was uh, there were a couple of exhaust fan issues that you know, we were dealing with up there. So again, okay. those are those are ones that still allow us to open up classrooms, do what we need to do, um, and, and they can be fixed. Um, you know, as we kind of move forward. Okay. Um, all right. I know something that has come up um, and been a like I've heard it at a couple um, school committee meetings. Actually, Matt, you may have been the one that brought it up, um, but I put it on the just things to try to discuss tonight. But a, a tour of facilities um, and readiness. And I was thinking, you know, we don't necessarily want to have a, a big public tour of anywhere because um, we don't want the public in anywhere. We're giving it to the students and the you know, everything like that. But, um, you know, it might not even make sense to have something for the full committee, but maybe for the subcommittee, do a video, um, and then let that video be seen by parents, teachers, the school committee. So, and then, you know, we could report out to the school committee, um, you know, and, and Daryl pipe in with any, if you think it's a good idea, bad idea. Yeah, so like I actually, it was funny because you know Bob and I were talking a little bit about that today. He's like, well, I'd be happy to walk them through the buildings. I've got to go back through a couple of the other ones. So I, I said, Bob, if <laughs> if if you've got the time, um, you know that that's fantastic. So he, what what's nice about that is, uh, and again, you know, Matt had asked me about that, you know, probably three or four weeks ago. Now, in terms of 
getting having the opportunity for people to get in there just to see what it looks like, just to say, okay, what what do the bathrooms look like? Are there partitions in there yet or not? You know, what's the signage look like? How, what do we have on the floor? Uh, what partitions might be in place in different places? So, um, I think it's a good idea. We uh, you know we do have each each school has that aligns with kind of the plan that I sent out last night. Each school has its own plan. Most schools have put pictures in of like, hey, here's what the cafeteria looks like now. Here's what a classroom looks like now here. So a lot of that stuff's already um, out there. Um, you know, I don't know whether or not the video is gonna be great because I think it's probably gonna make people a little sick. But, um, you know, if there's a way for us to take pictures, you know, of, hey, here's an example. Well, well that's it. It may just be a, a slideshow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that would be worth kind of sharing with, with school committee. And, you know, again, it, it's a good way to kind of show, okay, here's, what's, here's what the schools look like. Um, you can then also kind of share that out as people ask you questions, you know, as school committee members, because again, I think that's one thing that not pe people aren't going into the buildings right now. We're really, you know, visitors aren't supposed to really be in there. So we're, we're doing our best to kind of, um, you know, abide by that as best we can. But I think that's, I think that's a good way to do it. Um, and, you know, if that's how the committee wants to do it and move forward, we just probably only want a couple of people going in now. Um, it, it, it can't be, can't really be more than probably two or three, maybe four. As, as we kind of walk around. Okay. Um, I know just thinking about it right now, um, from a parent perspective, you know, I would definitely be interested in seeing, you know, just in some sort of documentation that goes out and it may be building specific, but what's the protocol if I have to stop at the school and drop something off? You know, just make sure the parents are aware of that. Um, what's, what does the room look like if my kid is coughing for any reason and he gets pulled out and I've got to pick him up? Where are they going to be? Like, are they, you know, because you, know, you, you always picture the worst. You picture this, you know, they get stuck in a closet, in a like padded closet or something like, no, it's going to be this room and, um, yep. Yep. you know, it's going to be like this. And um, but then, you know, a typical, Maybe a few classrooms, just quick pictures, uh, something like that. Yep, that's that's what I would like to see. And then, like you said, the the signage, um, general ideas of the flow, how it's going to go, and you know, in general, it could be you know, pick a school or two and discuss those. But that is something that probably should come back from each school to the parents going to that school. Yeah. So one of the things that will Again, you know, as as this documentation goes out, um, we're we're going to be uh, we're doing a lot over <laughs> over the next few days. But um, we are, and we're also looking at uh, each of the plans because, again, with the thirteen schools, looking at uh, each plan, so you know, everyone had that template. We're going through the template to ensure that there's consistency and where they need to do their own individual thing like how kids enter and exit the building what what spaces they use and so forth um that's you know that's the other part and we're just ensuring that okay yep that makes sense that makes sense mm, okay may, we might want to ask them to reword something but uh you, you know that'll all go out i'll double check on the on the pictures because i know as i've gone i gone through these Several of them had really nice photographs, just giving examples of what the spaces look like within, within the building. So I, I, I'll, I'll double check with, I'm meeting with principals tomorrow morning, so. Okay. Dan, remind me to talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> Got it. Anybody comments, think it's a good idea? Think, I mean, would, you know, it, I, th I think it would be good for the subcommittee to possibly be involved in a, a tour of one or two spaces and then can report out to the committee. I don't know if you agree, Matt. Um, I would just yeah. say as committee chair, I think that would be useful for the entire committee, Adam. So if you and Matt, okay. I mean, because you guys have three people on your committee, so it's super small. The three of you yeah. want to and even take your own pictures. Um, I think, you know, it's kind of, Pictures worth a thousand words. Yeah. Visual would be really 
if you guys are willing, I don't want to put you guys out there or tell you to do something that you're not comfortable with. But if you are comfortable, um, I, I would find it very useful. I think it would be super useful to do that. Um, one yeah. idea I think might be worth consideration if you have conversations tomorrow with principals is maybe asking them to either take or share pictures of like key places that they think represent kind of what schools will look like, whether it's a classroom, whether it's um, entry and exit, whether it's bathrooms. And a suggestion that I'd have is, you know, I know that you'll send out your newsletters, but I think we're in a time where people are craving information. And I'd almost say, send it out in a series like, hey, I just wanted to update you. These are what some classrooms would look like and just send out pictures of classrooms. And then maybe the next day or two days later, here's what bathrooms would look like. That will allow people to get a visual to that point of a picture's worth a thousand words. It might also, you might want to just think about it from the perspective as well that if you put everything in one email, classrooms, entry, exit, this, people might just start not really focusing on, on what it looks like. So that's just, I think you're in a, it's almost like a marketing drip campaign that you almost have to, you know, give to people to kind of get them used to, it's going to look a little different or a lot differently in some cases. No, Matt, I think that's great. Almost like your Patriots hype video, right? Like game day's coming, game day's coming soon. So here's, you know, we're 14 days out, here's, here's snack time. We're, we're 12 days out, here's uh, parent, right? So like, like a topic of the day or a topic every two days. Um, like Matt, you're right, you're right on with that. And make it fun for the principals. Take pictures of yourself with PPE on, if you don't mind it being sure. Here's what the principal's going to look like, right? I mean, it's yeah, you can have fun with that stuff, right? Yeah, I like I mean, that. We're all used to wearing masks today. I want to see Principal Biendo in a gown, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so would I. <laughs> I, I, but I'd be up for, um, you know, Adam, if you wanted to coordinate whatever location that is, I mean, I'm happy to go anywhere in the district that makes sense. Um, I think that okay. would be good, especially reporting back to full school committee and essentially the public who tend to watch right. our meetings now more than probably TV. We are very yeah. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk to Bob about that. Um, tomorrow, Adam. And, um, okay. you know, we'll, we'll look at some times when, you know, this can happen, you know, it won't happen this week. Um, but some probably sometime next week, um, if, if you want to do a small little caravan to go around to two or three buildings, I think that would be nice. Okay. Um, you know, and just throwing it out there, two people in this committee is automatically a quorum. Um, so, you know, when, when we're on the tour, we'll just have to be very cognizant not to discuss amongst ourselves what we're seeing. Um, and I'll try to schedule something, even if it's just a really quick meeting, you know, that evening or the next day, something like that. Um, we can discuss it. Um, I think that'd be good. Adam, the other thing that you could do, and I was thinking, so if we're concerned about pulling people together, um, and having a quorum, we could have, right, like Matt could go to Central Tree. You could go to yeah. Mayo. Uh, and you, yeah. So you could, we could do it so that, you know, Matt goes to two schools, you go to two schools. Um, you know, if Linda wants to do it, Linda goes to two schools. And then you hit up half the district right there. Yeah. I like yeah that's, that's a great idea. I like that. Yeah. Okay. You get away from any potential, you know, quorum violations. Violations, right. Yeah. That's Even great. better. Good. Okay. okay. We'll work on that. All right. Awesome, guys. Good job. Um, anything else related to, you know, requirements for reopening in November? Anything else? The only thing, if, if people don't mind, I just want to bring this up because I've got to get working on answering questions. But um, the... It, one thing that we um, have been 
questioned about a little more um, as we get closer to reopening is just the concept of having um, our younger students. Uh, you know, we haven't mandated masks. You know, we followed the, the DESE regulations, uh, you know, even with the, the mask protocol and um, policy that was put in place. But um, we're, we're looking at this and we're getting a lot of feedback saying, you know what, we'd, we'd really like there maybe to be uh, it, it having all students wear masks. So we're doing that on buses. Why aren't we doing that in school? Um, uh, we did have um, Dr. Wace, who is the doctor for the district. He shared with uh, us today that he highly recommends that all students wear masks. Um, uh, you know, especially, you know, in, as we kind of get closer to uh, winter and, um, you know, we're closing windows, we don't, you know, air circulation is there, but it's, it's, it's a different, it's a very different reality. So um, just wanted to put this out there to that group. Um, so as we kind of move forward, whether or not we um, bring it back to the full school committee and, you know, amend the policy. Um, but, uh, you know, again, when, when I hear from our, uh, our, our medical professionals to and when they say, "Hey, you know, you should really be doing this." I mean, you know, we want to we want to be able to follow it as closely as possible. So, I just wanted to throw that out there to people, um, and you know, we kind of start working on it. Thoughts? I guess I, Matt, go ahead. <laughs> I think the only the only question I have is for the people who, for one reason or another, cannot wear a mask, right? And I, I think that it's important to have a policy that, I don't want to say mandates, but mandates masks to be required if there's a reason why you cannot. I think there has to be some level of a discussion point around that to figure out what's best for everybody, but that's... I yeah, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, Matt. And I think the policy actually addresses that um, pretty nicely in terms of uh, looking at that that concept. You, you know, if a student can't wear a mask for whatever particular reason, um, you know, that would be that would be something that we would address. So, I uh, do think it's um, important, though, too, as people think about it, that you have to start. If your kid's not used to wearing a mask and you're thinking about sending it back, I mean, you're less yeah. than a month away, you should really be working on, on building that um, mask tolerance up. I would agree, but I, I would think that, you know, in looking at the that happened, um, I think we are kind of in the minority of not mandating everybody. Um, I think it's, it's especially, it's just protocol period. Um, you know, you go to the grocery store, you see one and two year olds who are happily masked up. Um, so I think for our safety of a large building, let's say even, you know, your two K through eight schools, you're really looking at, you know, students from the age of five to the age of 14, right? Like, and if you have a large cohort who are not wearing masks, I think that can lead to spread. Um, and that's the, the ultimate that we don't want. I agree. I, I definitely don't have an issue with um, going to that. Um, I think no matter, it, it's just the way the world is now, no matter any decision we make, we're going to get pushed back some more. Um, just a little. It, it is. I mean, we could say nobody wears a mask. Everybody's going to push back. So right. everybody's right. going to push back. Um, but, you know, as, as long as we have a good valid backup to it, which, you know, with the doctor's letter, I think we do. Yep. Um, we bring it up. It's discussed as policy. And you know we can go forward with it. Um, so what I what my thought is, you know, in my next newsletter um, that goes out either this week or uh, you know either on Friday um, to kind of wrap up some of the questions that get answered, or uh, on Monday, what I would do also in there is probably talk a little bit about exactly what you just said, Matt. Getting kids used to wearing them. So saying that you know, you know at this time, you know, we would want to make sure that you know all students are ready to wear masks. Uh, you know, as they come into school, and uh, again, the the way we we've, we've framed it, it's um, it's recommended for those students. It's not mandated, but I think I can probably find some good wording that um, basically says, you know, we want you to wear it now. Getting and saying, hey, you know what, 
just have your kids start wearing it. Get prepared um, just in case. Ki I know kids are doing it already, um, but it, I, I think it's, it's probably a, a good way to go right now. So, and if, you know, so on, on our meeting on the 9th, uh, if people are good with that, I think we just, we, you know, it can get brought up under changing that. And um, I don't think we're going to get a lot. We'll, we'll get some pushback, but I think it's going to be okay. And I, I think, as you said, I don't think, go ahead. I don't think you, you need to put it in the policy, but I also think that there might be um, concerns around mask breaks and making sure that there's an opportunity for a mask break or how do you handle that, right? Yep. So, um, and that, you know, what's interesting in all of the, the school, um, return to school booklets, whatever, you know, the, uh, hand, not handouts, but the menus that we're going to be sending out, there are, they specify, you know, kind of the mass breaks, how they're going to break down in the time frame, and so forth. So, cause again, I think that's, that's a big concern. As you get younger, it might need, you might just need to think about the frequency of that versus older. Yeah. Yeah. And, just, and actually, I think just making that happen, like donning and doffing it for a small child, like and putting it on a paper towel, or if you're doing it outside, where do I put my mask? Like, that is that is the number one challenge I've heard from every educator is the mask break itself because it is a logistical nightmare. nightmare. So, <laughs> what they did, and at, at you know, a private school I'm aware of, they gave the kids lanyards oh, yeah. with double clips on the end and um you're talking middle school and up none of the kids wear them because they're not cool to wear a lanyard around your neck with it but i would think uh k through two would be happy to wear a lanyard that they could clip to their mask and that could be a appropriate um investment if that could be done through any of that PPE money, right? Or just, it's probably short change to do that. But I think that encourages, to Megan's point, the safe, like, where do I put it? Well, don't worry about it. And it could be something that's cool. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. Dan. Yeah, I think one of the, is, is it, I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the, uh, other things to look at, you know, like, you know, grades three and up, definitely like if kids are taking their masks off all the time, like that's that's a discipline issue. Whereas K to two, you know, we want you to wear it all the time, but there's a little more leeway and let's, you know, we're focusing on getting you to wear it and understanding why you need to. You know, grade three and up, you should know why and you should be doing it. It's like it's like those kindergarten kids you get that don't want to wear shoes. Yeah. Like you're in a school you have you gotta wear shoes it's okay and you work with them through the year and gosh by the by the beginning of first grade there they can't take their shoes off and they go to bed with them <laughs> i did want to mention at the ecc we do have lanyards oh good so that's so carolyn you're in charge of getting them out to all the schools got it thanks <laughs> I, I, know, but I do think that's, that's a good idea. Um, Thank you for volunteering. I, yeah. <laughs> so I think, and part of it is just getting, you know, having the opportunity for those kids. I, I think, you know, it's funny. I, I think Bob actually does that where he has a lanyard and he holds on to his disposable masks uh, that way. It, it, it's just, it's always there. So um, that's a good point. Okay. So I, I probably have to run because I, I, I've got a lot to get done tonight. Yep. So No, I'm. I'm, I'm good with wrapping up. Um, okay. I just pull up the agenda real quick. So the only other item, yeah, I'm going to skip over the fields and outdoor facilities unless you had a long talk with Holden. Yeah, okay. Nope. Um, subcommittee policy review, just 10 seconds, Matt. Um, we're looking at some policies that haven't been updated in a while. Mostly, I think it's the 6,000 series. Um, it's on the agenda. There's a million things that are more important right now, but we want to try to at least get some of those up there and get a schedule that we can attack. And um, All right, beyond that, next meeting. Um, I know Rebecca said next week is pretty full for you, Daryl. Um, yeah, yeah, next week's tough. Week after might be a little better for me. Um, what, what's okay. happening is the negotiations is taking is – taking, a couple of evenings at a t yeah, Carolyn knows it. So it's, 
<laughs> it's like two nights a week, and then I typically have at least two meetings a week on top of it. So it's. Um, I think, you know, I, I got some feedback from Linda just on times, and she's fairly open the week after next, so the the first week of November. Um, I'm pretty wide open. Actually, I am open that week. Um, so I don't know about you, Matt, if you have any hard stops on anything. No, I'm good. Okay. Okay. How about the, could I propose the fourth? It's Wednesday. Yep. Um, Maybe a yeah. six, six starting time and kind of the same thing, if that works for people. Yeah, I think I, I think I can do that if six works for everybody else. Okay. All right. Awesome. I'll email Rebecca and see if that's what we're looking at. And you know, if something comes up, let us know. Okay. That's what we'll shoot for. Okay. All right. I will. I didn't want to do it on. I didn't want to put it on the third. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I was. It just popped up with election day. I was like, I, uh, yeah, we probably want that day. Yeah. No. 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 I was. I wanted to hold off. So. Um, all right. I don't have anybody have new business. Nope. I will entertain a motion to adjourn then. We'll make a motion to adjourn. All right. I'll second that. Matt. Lavoy, yes. <laughs> Young, yeah. It's super easy in this subcommittee. It is. All right. Thank so, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it's a thank you. Too. Have and a good night. Take care. I'll, I'll have stop a good the night. Meeting. Thank you, you so much for going through my concerns. Thanks, oh, Carolyn. Yeah. As always. Okay, good night. Right. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Yep. Bye.